I think I'll start by saying, and, and now for something a little different. Um, I'm not sure that the uh, introductory material will apply as much to pi RNA, but I think that some of the opportunities and challenges that we've talked about with CRISPR and Talon and some of the other approaches to gene editing will um, become clear as I talk about this alternate approach to editing. And in this approach, we're really focusing on editing the epigenome, and in particular, editing one part of the epigenome, editing the DNA methylome. And to make it even more <laughs> limiting, um, with pi RNAs, we're talking about a unidirectional editing. So we're talking about inducing DNA methylation at very particular sites in the epigenome. And before I begin, I'd like to um, start by thanking Gary Miller and the rest of the committee for inviting us here to um, participate in the meeting and to speak today, and also acknowledge my colleague, colleague Penny Pereira is here in the audience. She is um, a very active participant in this research, as is Christopher Falk, who's also lifted, listed here, who was a postdoc in my laboratory when we wrote this transformative R01 high-risk, high-reward grant, and is now um, in his third year of his own laboratory at the University of Minnesota. Green button. I see. It doesn't look as green as you said it would look. <laughs> um, this is a, a newly inserted slide to the talk. I wanted to just spend a few moments introducing the epigenome, and then I'll follow that up by telling you about um, two challenges that I think that are really important when we consider the effects of toxicants on the epigenome. So as we all know through the Great Human Genome project. We now th know that we have about 3 billion bases, and if you laid this genetic material end to end, it would be about 2 meters in length. So cells have these packaging problems because they're only micrometers. So they use epigenetic marks such as DNA methylation and histone modification and non-coding RNAs, which are not shown here on this um, very famous picture of the epigenome, to help compact this genetic material into the cell. So if you want a canonical definition of epigenetics, I added it there. Um, we could spend all day talking about that first word, heritable. But let's just assume that it means mitotically heritable. So heritable changes in gene expression that occur in the absence to changes to the DNA sequence itself. So the epigenome creates both challenges and opportunities for gene expression. Some of the challenges are, because now we know that genes need to be compact but poised for action, this can also allow for toxicants and other things to come in and alter the epigenome. And some of these alterations can be adaptive, some of them can be neutral, and some of them can be negative. But in contrast to the genome, which is static, except in the context of this gene editing <laughs> conference that we're talking about today, the epigenome is dynamic and potentially modifiable. So it's hopeful. We may be able to use nutritional or pharmacological or what I'm going to talk about today, epigenome editing approaches to counteract negative effects of the environment on the epigenome. Which leads me to one of the first challenges in our field. And that is identifying at a population level who is at risk. And if they're at risk, what toxicants are they at risk from? And there's been a lot of exciting work in this field of toxicoepigenetics in both animal models and human cohorts and clinical approaches. So for example, using mouse models, we have looked at the endocrine disrupting chemical bisphenol A and identified a fairly large number of DNA methylation sites that are altered upon exposure to this chemical. So this is in the three week old liver of a mouse. And if you ask um, a sort of pathway analysis, who are these genes, where are they working? You begin to tease out some of the pathways that are affected by BPA in an epigenetically um, regulated manner. And these include both immune response and metabolism. And because we really want to talk about how to affect human health, there's been a great interest in replicating these animal model studies in humans. And so we've done this in a number of different human cohorts. So this is a pathway analysis of uh, Egyptian girls who are exposed to high levels of bisphenol A or low levels of bisphenol A. And interestingly, even though we are not able to access the liver of these girls, we're in fact using saliva DNA, we were able to identify very similar biological pathways in which the methylome is, is altered, including immune response and metabolism. So this is some hope that we may be able to use epigenetic epidemiology in a way to identify those who are at risk at a population level. 
And this field has um, gained a lot of traction and funding from the National Institute of Institutes of Health over the last several years, including the Human Epigenome Project, which released 111 different cell types. So this was you know, one cell, one point in time. And we know the epigenome is dynamic over time. And the roadmap did not um, look at environmental exposures. So we have some new programs led by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences called TARGET. And in particular, these are using mouse models. So we talked earlier about, you know, do you go from humans to mice or animal models and back? And so these, these are some really nice approaches where you start you know, with the humans and then we follow it up with mouse models when we bring in environmental exposures with the idea of, you know, there's a consortium of individuals who are exposing mice to all different types of chemicals from metals to endocrine disrupting chemicals to particulates and collecting things in a very rigorous and similar manner and then asking questions, you know, if we're interested in environmental effects of metals on the brain and we can look at that in the mice, but we might not be able to get access to the brain in humans, does the brain methylome of these mice match the blood methylome or other surrogate tissues such as skin, which we can get easily from ear. <clears throat> other NIH-wide efforts, including the CHEER program here, as well as the new ECHO programs and the um, established children's environmental health centers, have been also doing this in human cohorts. And so this is just an example of individuals who have act um, human samples and they want to add on environmental exposures or epigenomics can apply to the tier program to have these run for free. So we've, we're doing really well in tackling this problem of how do we identify environmental toxicants, how do we identify individuals who are at risk. And in the new ECHO program, which is a parallel to this tier program, they are going to add in a lot of gen genomic variation. Which leads me to our second challenge, which I'd like to focus on for the rest of the time today. And thanks to Dr. Wojcik for introducing some of my favorite animals. What are we gonna do about all of this once we know who's at risk and we know the environmental chemicals? So how can we make this yellow mouse brown? How can we help this yellow mouse not um, develop the adult onset obesity that we know that she's going to develop? So this is the viable yellow agouti mouse. And as you um, heard earlier, these um, are genetically identical mice that have a single epigenetic change at the ABY locus in which this animal has a lack of DNA methylation. It has histone marks that are open. And the genetically identical litter mate has um, gained methylation and has closed repressive chromatin marks. Um, we've done a number of studies with these animals where you give the mother diets high in folic acid, betaine, vitamin B12, or toxicants like lead or BPA or phthalates, and you can shift the population of these mice. And everybody wants to know, you know, what can I do to change myself from that yellow mouse? Is there anything I can do? So there are a number of epigenetic modifiers that are out. Um, some of them are even FDA approved for use in certain types of cancers, but I would call them genome-wide or global epigenetic modifiers. So we have pharmaceuticals like adocytosine, and we have HDAC inhibitors, which act to open up the genome. Um, but these target the entire epigenome. They don't target specific regions that you might want to be turned on, so like demethylating a tumor suppressor gene. So they have a lot of off-target effects. So we have a challenge in the field to try to develop target-specific epigenome editing. And I don't think I need to go into great detail on um, these technologies, because this is what has been introduced today, um, merely to point out that they have various um, specificity off targets and engineering um, pros and cons. So the approach that we're taking is quite different. We're looking at non-coding RNAs. And this is a wonderful slide that Penny put together um, that helps shows all of the various roles of of RNA, and so you can see that we know that RNA is particularly important for chromatin state, um, producing um, of alternate pr protein isoforms, the mobilization of functional cassettes. But what I want to focus on today is RNA's role in transcription and in transcription silencing. So um, when you hear about you know microRNA, there are two really important pathways with microRNA. 
um, the one that wins the Nobel, Nobel Prize that targets the degradation of the mRNA. So that's a really important biological process, but that's not epigenetic. We're talking about the other side of the small RNAs. These are the RNAs that work at the transcriptional level to bring in um, histone modifications and DNA methylation to repress transcription on the DNA itself. <clears throat> and so the small RNA that I'm going to focus on today is over here on the right. This is pi RNA, not apple pie or 3.14. This is a product of our, our Drosophila friends. This is peewee, P element inducing wimpy testis um, RNA. And in contrast to the small RNAs that you may know more about, microRNAs and siRNAs, there are some similarities and differences. So um, you have these microRNAs that are 20 to 23 base pairs, the siRNAs, and they have um, various different hairpin or double-stranded precursors. Um, they associate with the argonaut proteins, and they either um, target, as I described before with mRNA, both protein uh, um, mRNA degradation or um, transcription um, repression, and the siRNAs that work directly with um, repressing retrotransposons. But these pi RNAs, they um, associate with an argonaut family protein called peewee, and they are um, most often known for being important in the germline. Um, it was really awkward once I had to describe to a, a, a reporter, asked me, what is the germline? So we're talking about the eggs and the sperm, um, and they're um, active in repressing transposons, which is really important during that stage of development. There's a couple other um, differences here that I'd like to point out. One, in which makes these pi RNAs particularly suitable to epigenome editing, is the presence of this um, two prime O methylation at the three prime end right here. This causes this RNA species to be more stable than these and be able to be used more um, as a therapeutic poten potentially. And the other thing that I'll point out is um, this, you know, complete in many different um, texts and review articles, and, and even in the ones that are included in some of your reading materials, um, focus on pi RNAs in the germline. So this is the first thing we really must overcome when we're thinking about adapting pi RNAs for epigenomic editing. And we're talking about epigenomic editing in the soma because, right, we want to turn that yellow mouse brown and get her lean again. So we want to get it into the brain and we want to get it into the periphery so that, um, that that agouti gene will be repressed and she'll act more like her um, genetically identical yet methylated litter mates. So the first question we, we wanted to overcome is, is pi RNA machinery specific to the germline? And so you have um, a number of studies from Hafan Lin, um, who was actually um, on my dissertation committee at Duke. So this is, I remember cramming for this, <laughs> um, for what are pi RNA questions, even though my dissertation had nothing to do with it. So just another example of how small science is. Um, to, you know, more recently in 2012 and 2000. 14, looking at pi RNAs in the brain. So people have begun to, in animal models, find these pi RNAs in the brain. They have also um, begun to notice that they're important for retrotransposon repression, which is exactly what they're doing in the germline as well. And then there are also um, new reports that they're really important in stem cells. So moving to the human side of things, they have also, just like their miRNA counterparts, become pretty important biomarkers for certain types of cancers. And so you'll see here a number of, of studies that have looked at one cancer or the other, and also you see a report here on Alzheimer's disease. Um, so there's growing evidence that these pi RNAs are present in non-germline cells and also pretty important biomarkers, especially for cancer. Which leads me to this quote from Hafan Lin. So this was a, these PWE proteins were originally discovered in 2006 and 2007, and a few years ago they wrote a commentary in Nature saying that the PWE pyrene pathway has been commonly perceived as a germline specific, even though the somatic function of the PWE proteins was documented when they were first discovered. So I guess we all need to read our literature a little bit closer. So if you go back to the original papers, that, that it, it was there, but it wasn't the focus. Um, so our first step is to take a pretty comprehensive approach to assess whether these uh, machinery and whether these pi RNAs are present in the soma of mice. 
And so you'll see here that we've look, we're looking at a number of different tissues, um, the, the whole brain, the hippocampus, heart, liver, kidney, and testes. And the first thing that we're going to do is just look at plain old qPCR expression of these PV proteins that are important for the biogenesis, which is what I'm going to go through a little bit now. So these PV proteins are transcribed in the nucleus, like many, like all proteins are, and then they're exported to the cytoplasm. And just note, we've color coded this for our future slides. Um, and then we have the um, production of the pi RNA species, um, you, usually from clusters across the genome. And these are single-stranded um, RNAs, which are then also exported to the cytoplasm, where they go through this really interesting and not completely worked out, and it's a um, little bit different from, from fly to, to rodent to humans. They go, for the, go through these primary processes uh, where they work with PL1 and PL2, and then they enter this really neat fun named cycle called the ping pong cycle, in which there is secondary amplification and production of pi RNAs in both a sense and antisense direction. And then they return home um, using PL4, um, where they act to, the mature pi RNAs now act to suppress in, in what is mostly known is transposable elements, such as line one. All right. So when we looked at the um, expression of PBL1, you'll now see there's a set of slides that look pretty similar. You have the germline here, the testes and the ovaries on the right side, and then our somatic tissues here. We saw low but present ex expression of PBL1 in the brain and hippocampus and very low in the heart. As we move to the second uh, protein, PBL2, we see that this is a little bit more widespread across our six somatic lineages. Um, but still in comparison to the testes, um, very low expression. And finally, as we look at the, the last protein, PL4, we also see that this is um, expressed across the somatic um, lineages. So this was some of our first evidence that, hey, okay, maybe we're not crazy, maybe NIH is not crazy for funding us. We do have preliminary evidence that the pi RNA machinery is present in the somatic lineages. So next, we took advantage of that O, that two, that two prime O methylation, to do a pretty interesting RNA seq study where we're um, sequencing and selecting specifically for pi RNAs. So there are a number of pi RNA databases out there, mostly focused on the testes, a few on the brain, but mo the majority, the vast majority of them, haven't used. Um, this technique that I'm going to describe, describe to you called pariodate treatment to really separate out the pi RNAs from the micro and SI RNAs. And so there's probably a lot of false positives in there. So what does a typical pi RNA structure look like? Um, this is what is known from the germline. So if you, you read lots of papers, you'll get some variation in here, but it's, it was typically thought that a pi RNA was about 24 to 32 nucleotides in length. It has this really neat five prime uridine signature and then an adenosine signature at the 10th position, and then this 2 prime O methylation at the 3 prime end. And they're highly clustered across the genome. So taking advantage of, um, so oh, you can see the nice animations here. So taking advantage of that 2 prime O methylation, we're able to use sodium pariodate to um, select out the pi RNAs from the other non-coding RNAs. And um, we did this in, um, mice as well, and we looked at both the hippocampus, cortex, liver, and kidney, and then we sequenced it um, on the 2500 high seq All right. So I didn't want to completely eliminate this slide because I want to give credit to, to Zing Tsai, who's done an amazing job developing this bioinformatics pipeline for a, a very new technology. But I do not, I'm not the expert on all the details. But basically what, what you do is you take, excuse me, you take both your um, untreated and your treated, so these are the pride treated samples, and you run them through this pipeline and you identify the pi RNAs that are expressed across the different um, uh, somatic lineages. And <clears throat> here are some of the, the first exciting results that we were super excited to see these, this sequence logo. Um, so this is across the cortex, hippocampus, kidney, liver, and then the testes, which a lot was known about, you can see that we have that enrichment of the uridine at the first position, as well as an enrichment of the adenosine at the 10th position. And what's really interesting that I, I know that in contrast to the 40,000 
pi RNAs that you see here in testes, we are detecting pi RNAs in the somatic lineages with higher pi RNAs expressed in the brain. So that's really, really exciting to be able to detect them. But what um, is really clear, and which we'll rewrite some of the, the books, is that these pi RNAs that we're finding in the somatic lineages are not 24 to 32 nucleotides in length. They're shorter. So if you focus down below on the testes, you can see that if we cut off at 24 base pairs, we still have our 40,000. Um, and if you move it down to 20, you're not gaining a whole lot more pi RNAs. <clears throat> but if you look at some of the other um, cell types, you can see here in the cortex, if we limit it to 24 nucleotides in length, we're um, identifying 915. But if we relax that to 20, we're um, identifying over, over 2,000. Um, and this is true for the other somatic lineages as well. So there's something very different about the pi RNAs in the soma compared to the testes. And this is further shown here in these Venn diagrams, which on the left side, you see the testes, pi RNA, ohm. And on the right, you see the pi RNAs in the various somatic lineages. And so you can immediately see that there is some overlap, but it's pretty low overlap between the testes um, and the highest overlap occurs in, in the brain. Down below here, I'm sorry, it's a little bit small. This is just comparing the four somatic lineages. And if you look right in the middle here, there are 70 pi RNAs that are the same between, that are found in all four uh, cell types. And of these 70, 40 of them are also found in the, te in the testes. So there are about 30 somatic specific pi RNAs that we've identified, but the vast majority of these pi RNAs appear to be cell specific. And so this may, um, even though we only set out to do target specific methylation, this may give us some options to be able to be able to do cell specific methylation as well. All right. So to summarize th this first part, we are seeing pi RNAs in the somatic cells. They are shorter in length. Something I didn't have a chance to show you because of the time of the talk is we're also seeing an increased number of unique pi RNAs compared to pi RNAs that are originating from uh, transposable elements or repeats, which shows that there might be some really unique roles for pi RNA that we don't understand yet in somatic tissues, um, and that there appears to be a higher sequence overlap between somatic um, tissues compared to the somatic tissues and the testes. All right, so where do we go from here? And I told you the story, I, I meant to tell you at the very beginning that the story is incomplete and you won't be, you'll be happy when we're, we're done, but uh, we have now moved pi RNAs in vivo using our very fav favorite famous mouse model, the viable yellow agouti mice. Um, with the very simple question, can we turn a yellow mouse brown? And thank you to Dr. Wojcik for introducing the famous mice. So you see here that they have this contra orientally uh, inserted IAP element. It's the lack of methylation, the increase of histone acetylation at this place that makes these yellow mice express the gene all the time when it normally should be off and in all cells when it only should be on during a specific period of development in the hair cells. And these animals ha gain, have methylation and repressive histone marks. Um, so in the lab, we are engineering synthetic pi RNAs that target the ABY locus. And this is a little bit about how we're doing it. This is, I'm sure, what everyone in CRISPR field has, and other fields have gone through. There's a lot of um, timing and dosage and um, multiplexing that um, studies that we've tried to figure out the right combination of pi RNAs. Uh, but the ultimate experiment will look like this. Can you turn a yellow mouse brown by using a pi RNA complementary to the ABY locus? At the same time, could you give the mice a DNA, global DNA methylation inhibitor like 5-azocytidine, which would turn the mice yellow because it's a global demethylator. But if at the same time as you gave 5-azocytidine, if you gave pi RNAs, could you protect this agouti locus and um, only demethylate regions that you wanted to be demethylated? Um, we also have parallel work going on with the BDNF gene, which is really important in anxiety and alcohol preference in mice. Um, so there are a couple advantages of these. So this um, approach avoids transgenic. Um, you don't need ex exogenous proteins. Um, once the DNA is methylated, it will take advantage of the endogenous transcription ma machinery to faithfully replicate in a heritable way um, the DNA methylation. And so there are a number of different laboratory and clinical 
um, approaches that one could imagine. Uh, but there are a, a number of disadvantages to starting this out in, a, in, a, in a, an academic lab. We're um, really having some time identifying the dosage and frequency of the administration. And as I alluded to at the very beginning, we can only go one way with the DNA methylation. Um, I think I'll, I'll leave these for tomorrow because I'll be participating in the brainstorming session. Um, but there's a number of clinical and laboratory approaches. So with that, I'd like to thank Chris for being my partner in crime in this work and the NIH for funding. And I'd be happy to answer questions during the panel. Thank you.